Okay, I think it's 12 o'clock now, so I'm sure people will join as I'm talking. Um, first of all, welcome. Um, this is the third in the Diverse Voices series, um, and these are kind of informal conversations that aim to help, uh, I guess, amplify and celebrate the diversity of scientists working in and around the field of weather and climate, kind of in the UK, possibly even a bit beyond. Um, my name is Regan Murtar, I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter, um, and I'm kind of co-hosting this series with Asha Aslam, who is a PhD student at Leeds uh, and is also on the call. Um, and today we're going to be hearing from two speakers who will tell us about their kind of career paths to and experiences of working at the Met Office. But before we get into that, I've got a bit of housekeeping. Um, so we would ask you to please keep muted for the talk. If you want to turn your camera on, that is very, very welcome. Um, if you want to ask questions to our speakers, you can put them in the, the Q&A section um, or in the chat anytime and we can ask them at the end. Um, and if you want to make the slides bigger just at this portion, then you can just close the chat. Um, and if you're having any technical issues at any point with Zoom, then you can try a different browser, closing, reopening, uh, the classic turn it off, turn it on again. Um, and if you have any issues, again, post in the chat um, and we can try and help you out with that. I also wanted to highlight, as you may have seen, this is being recorded um, and it will be uploaded to the Royal Met Sox uh, YouTube page probably in, in July. And if you've missed the first two in this series, then those are already on the YouTube page. So you can kind of search them, watch them, share them around any time that you like. Um, and this series kind of complements actually another initiative which we are calling the um, Early Careers of Colour Network. And this is an online community that you can register to join following this QR code or this link, which I'll post in the chat later. Essentially, if you're an early career of colour working in this field, whether you're in industry or in academia or something in between, um, then this kind of is a, an online community that that will help support you. You can even offer your support to other early careers. Um, and so we would love for, for you to join up. And I guess maybe a little um, teaser, if you're coming to the early career conference in July, I think first of the 3rd of July, then we'll be having a bit of an in-person meetup. So it'd be amazing to see you there. And I think that's probably uh, enough from me. I will stop sharing. Um, I think we're going to hand over to our first speaker today, uh, and that is Dr. Michael Lai. Uh, Michael studied physics and philosophy at the University of Bristol before going on to do a PhD at the University of Reading on understanding the drivers of North Atlantic variability in climate models, I believe. Uh, and Michael now works on high resolution global climate modelling at the Met Office. So I'm going to hand over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Regan. Um, no one's really called me doctor before, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, um, yeah, so my name's Michael. Um, I've been at the Met Office for about a year and a half now. So um, I think the advert said two senior academics, and I'm not senior at all, um, just to just to just to say. Um so yeah, so I'll I guess I'll talk a bit about my sort of motivations and journey into how I got into climate science and how I ended up with the Met Office. Um, so I was born in Hong Kong, but moved over to the UK when I was quite young, uh, about nine years old. So we moved from Hong Kong to Aberystwyth, a small town on the west coast of Wales. So that was quite a big change. But um, I think I actually really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> it felt like it was a lot less stressful. Um, and it was nice. And um, yeah, and I think for a very long time, as with many other people in school, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I wasn't always interested in climate science and I didn't find myself particularly passionate about any subjects in school. And I think when you were younger, climate change was something that you always knew about, it was talked about, um, but really at the same level as like, dinosaurs or black holes or something it's just vaguely interesting I didn't really see it as a possible sort of career path and didn't really have any friends or family who did or thought about doing things like that um my dad always said how it would be nice to have a doctor or lawyer in the family um <laughs> uh yeah so I kind of rebelled a little bit and wanted to do something different but wasn't really sure what I wanted to do um and so when I got to applying for my undergrad, I thought um, 
came across physics and philosophy. Um, I didn't really know much about it. I thought it was a fascinating mix because kind of naively you would have think they were in opposition. So that intrigued me and I'm glad I did it because um, it really gave me quite a different perspective of how science is done compared to just doing the physics modules. Um, yeah, so all throughout my undergrad, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do, but kind of knew I wanted to do something that felt meaningful. Um, so I thought being a teacher would be a great job. Um, had kind of lofty ideals about education <laughs> and stuff. But then I did some volunteering as a tutor and in some schools and discovered how hard of a job it really was and didn't really think I was very suitable for it. Um, so yeah, I was back to square one. And I think there were two things that made me settle on climate science in my final year. First was the research projects that I did um, for physics. And I think I then realized that I've always found sort of structured learning lessons, textbooks and lectures kind of difficult but the research project changed that. It was a completely different style of learning. You had to figure things out for yourself. There wasn't an answer sheet to look at. And I think the sense of discovery and kind of like owning what you're doing felt really great to me. Um, things didn't always work, but that was fine. I think I felt really motivated to get out of bed and into the lab every day. So I thought doing something like this was, yeah, something I could do. I'd never really thought about research before, but it, definitely seemed like something I wanted to do then. And um, the second thing was a philosophy module um, I did in my final year that Bristol ran called Global Justice and Climate Change. I think Bristol has quite a strong department on sort of environmental philosophy. And it kind of really opened my mind because climate change before then, like I was saying, it was just always in the background. You hear it in terms of like scientific geophysical terms. Um, but learning about the sort of ethical perspective of it was really interesting. And I think what really got me was learning about how sort of inherently unjust the problem is. And I think I didn't really quite realize before then, and I felt like I wanted to work on this field and hopefully be part of the solution. So these two things made me start looking at sort of possible PhDs in this space. And I was really attracted to how broad the field was. It seemed like at every level, there were considerations of physics, chemistry, biology, human actions. And yeah, that, that really appealed to me, I think. Um, at this point, <laughs> while looking at PhDs, I do realize I had done zero climate or environmental science at this point, I knew nothing really. And no coding experiences either because all the physics computational modules got replaced by philosophy so I did feel like it was a bit of a long shot um I was really trying to do a lot of new things um but luckily enough um I got a place to do a PhD in Reading working on North Atlantic variability and very lucky to have supportive and knowledgeable supervisors and um and I guess uh, my parents were quite surprised. Um, <laughs> they never really saw me as much as a, of a bookish person. And they didn't really know whether this was a stable career path because sort of none of the, they didn't really know anyone whose children were doing things like this. But um, yeah, I, I guess it didn't really matter to me. I think more important was that it seemed like it was something interesting. And um yeah, so as to how I got to work at the Met Office then, um, I think there was a lot of luck involved. Um, uh, so at the end of my PhD, I wasn't really thinking about um, careers or what to do next. I was too stressed with the thesis write-up. <laughs> um, and I think it was a few months before handing in, I was well into writing up very long days in the office <laughs> uh, but my supervisors gave me a heads up said oh there are these few sort of 
um, hirings out there. One was Met Office and some were other postdocs that they let me know about. Um, and I don't think I thought much about it, but I thought, okay, fine, I'll put a bit of time aside to write an application and pull it in and 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 just see. And I think kind of luckily the post that was being advertised at the Met Office was something that was quite closely related to my PhD. So it was about um, global high resolution climate modeling, a bit of a tongue twister that, but um, yeah, so my PhD was about looking at how resolution amongst other things um, affects um, the processes driving climate variability. So this new post was about looking at the wider impacts of uh, resolutions and inclusion of ocean eddies on the global climate. So um, it seemed like, luckily enough, um, the skills and the knowledge that I had from my PhD was um, perfect for the job. So um, I had an offer and I was very lucky. And, uh, and I think, yeah, moving down to Exeter was, um, was great. I, I like being in Exeter, it's close to Dartmoor. Um, and yeah, it's just a nice place to be. And I guess work-wise, it's quite similar to what I was doing before. And that's, I think, really down to my manager, who's happy to give me a lot of freedom. And it's quite exploratory in their work. Um, doesn't really define some, like, the things I have to do, but help me come up with objectives. So I think that was, um, that's great for me personally. Um, one other thing is that the Met Office is quite different to a university, not in the research, but in the sense that they work closely with government and other stakeholders. And as I said before, um, I think this dimension of the climate field is something I've always been interested in. And so, um, yeah, so I'm I'm very glad to be able to work at this organization and um, there are sort of opportunities to work with the knowledge integration teams to sort of do sort of climate science communication things with stakeholders to really sort of help get the um, knowledge to the people who might need it to make decisions and so on and yeah really bridging that um, science policy gap and that's something I hope to be able to um, uh, contribute to in the future, hopefully. But um, yeah, yeah, that's that's my introduction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, that was great. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I think we'll we'll go to Layla now, uh, and we'll have Q and at the end. So you know, in the back of your mind, everyone, if you've got questions, put them in the chat or or uh, or keep them ready for later. So uh, Layla is our next speaker. Dr. Layla Gohar did her uh, undergraduate degree and PhD at Imperial College London uh, with the latter in atmospheric physics. Layla then moved to the University of Reading for a postdoc looking at greenhouse gases and their radiative impact before moving to the Met Office. And I believe that you're based in Reading, if that's correct, um, and you're working on mitigation science and climate resilience. So over to you, Layla. Thank you, everyone. Um... Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for um, inviting me and being letting me be part of this you know, really positive and great initiative. And um, yeah, so let's talk about me. So I was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and um, we moved to London when I was very young. So my entire education was in London. But I, what I wanted to mention is that um, Almost every summer till my early teens, I spent in Karachi. So almost like two months of the year, every year. So, you know, that sort of formed, a, you know, had a big impact on me and on, on how I see myself because I was kind of immersed into um, different cultures. And um, so education wise, um, my parents always wanted us to really focus on our education. It was really important. Um, I know they provided the best education they could for us. And, you know, I was, I was pretty studious and um, I was kind of good at everything. I didn't have any 
subject that I excelled in, so I kind of really didn't know what I wanted to do. So at A-level, I decided to do maths, physics, and chemistry because I, I was kind of advised that if I did those three topics, then um, I'd have like a really wide um, opportunity to do different sort of um, careers if I chose. So um, I chose those three science uh, A-levels, but I did mention this to my careers advisor at school and um, she suggested that maybe I should uh, um, apply to these courses that at the time universities used to provide to try and encourage women to take up STEM careers. So I went to a short taster course at UCL for physics. And that was quite transformative. It was really amazing. I think it was like a two day or maybe three day course. And we went and they took us around the departments and they sort of told us the type of things we might be studying. So I thought, you know, this is something I'm quite interested in. I, th I could really see myself doing this as a degree. So I went back home and started looking at the possibility of, um, you know, what other universities I could apply to. And then, you know, I think it was kind of understood that my parents wanted me to be close to home. And since we lived in London, they would have, you know, their preference would have been that I chose a uh, London university. And, you know, I, I was okay with that because the universities in London are really good. And I actually wanted to go to Imperial. I really liked the campus there. And obviously Imperial has a great reputation. So I applied and, you know, luckily I got in. So I started my um, physics degree at the university and um, I could safely say that I had a great time as an undergraduate at Imperial. Um, I absolutely loved my degree. I loved almost every module I did. And again, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do afterwards. And it wasn't until my final year and um, when I did um, a course on atmospheric physics and, um, you know, I kind of failed to mention, but I but I've always kind of been environmentally inclined. I used to, as a child, um, raise money for, you know, saving the rainforest. And I think when I was younger, I kind of wanted to be maybe, um, you know, work for Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth at one point. So um, this really sparked that sort of um, my environmental leaning. So um, luckily, there was an opening for a PhD in atmospheric physics. So I applied for that and I got it. However, you know, my parents were a little bit perplexed because I'd already done a four year master of science sort of um, under, uh, undergrad degree. And they were sort of, I think they were concerned that I was being specialized. I was getting specialized too early and maybe I, you know, maybe I sh should, or why didn't I want to go out into the world and get a job and explore different options. And I kind of sort of understood where they were coming from. So um, so in part to kind of address their concerns, I applied to do an internship at a bank in the summer before my PhD. And you know, it was a really great thing that I did because it kind of really made it clear to me that I had no interest in finance, you know, Okay, I could have done something else, but it kind of helped me realize that actually, yes, I do want to do my PhD. So then I embarked on doing a PhD and, um, you know, I think everyone's PhD journey is different and I'm sure it's challenging for everyone. And for me personally, it was the first time I was challenged and which is not a negative thing, but it's, you know, and I think it's part of the process of being a researcher. But it taught, a, it taught me a lot of things and um, you know, it taught me that I was quite stubborn, that I was first, you know, I had a lot of perseverance and that I could do research. Oh, and I failed to mention what I did my PhD in. Um, I did it on the radiative contribution to the, um, at the entropy budget of the atmosphere. So this was kind of towards the idea of trying to come up with an additional constraint for global climate models. You know, we use global energy budget as one constraint, and this could also be used as an additional constraint. Um, so uh, I finished my PhD and started looking for jobs, and I knew I wanted to stay in academia. So um, 
there was an opening for a postdoc at the meteorology department in Reading Univers um, University of Reading, sorry. And this was in, you know, looking at the radiative forcing of greenhouse gases. So it was similar because it was in radiative physics. So it was kind of similar to what I had been doing, but not too similar. And then once I got the job, the postdoc, and I started working in the meteorology department, I was kind of firmly in the field of climate science. And I did, um, you know, I had a great time there. Um, I did a couple of postdocs, and then I applied for a post um, for the Met Office. So in the meteorology department, you also have a, a unit um, of the Met Office based there. So there was, you know, a lot of interaction there already. So um, when I started working for the Met Office, I worked um, in mitigation advice, which I found really fascinating. And here, this is what we do. And what I did was um, explore different emissions pathways to try and understand which ones would avoid dangerous or undesirable climate outcomes. And I did that using um, simple climate models, which are sort of more function, idealized function-based models. Um, um, of the climate system and um, they're calibrated against the more complex models. But the um, advantage of these of these simple climate models are that they're very fast, so you can um, sample lots of emission pathways. And so we kind of look at things like, you know, how much mitigation is required to maintain um, global mean temperatures below policy um, relevant temperature targets. And um, during my time in the Met Office, I've also sort of looked at um, climate change impacts using global um, climate model simulations. So, yeah, so that, that is, that's my journey. And yeah, I'll stop talking there. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, that, that sounds uh, very exciting. What a pathway. Um, OK, I think that we will go to Q&A, but I might just kick off with a, a more formal one before we stop recording and open to the audience. Something for both of you. Um, how did you both find the transition from academia to Met Office? I mean, was there much of a learning curve? I don't know, Leila, if you want to go first. Um, I think it is, as as Michael mentioned before, it is, it, the setup is slightly different. Um, I think, um, I, I think it, for me personally, I didn't find it that difficult. It was, um, it, you know, it was all right. It wasn't as different as I had thought it would be. You know, it's a little bit more um, cooperative. You know, I had a lot more um, training, you know, modules to attend and things like that. Um, but in terms of you know how you do your research you know as michael had already said that you have a little bit you have your objectives you can set those out um with your manager so that setup was you know it was kind of a smooth transition and and you know i think i just did really well i don't know about how, uh, michael about yeah how. i i agree um i think a lot of it's down to your manager as well like how they see how work should be defined, whether they're clear objectives or more exploratory and so on. I think for me, the Met Office building has open plan offices, which is different to how my PhD office was. There was a le lot less house plans, a lot less paper planes and nerf guns um, in the Met Office offices. <laughs> um, but uh, the other thing I found was that it's there because it's a government sort of department, there's a slight sort of corporate things, which is good in the sense that there are of more training and structure and so on and I think one thing I wasn't used to was time sheeting that's not something I've ever done before and that got me that yeah uh, it's just something you have to do um, but it's not something that you often think about that's work of science I think uh, yeah you kind of yeah it's it's not it didn't feel yeah it kind of gave a sense of this is more structured work and stuff like in a PhD where it was hard to really ever turn off from your projects um from your work because you knew you had a thesis to write at the end. So um yeah, so that was the difference for me. 